Podcast One presents the Steve Austin Show Classics. My wonderful wife, Kristen, is going to join us uh, in today's podcast session. We'll talk about the spider that bit Moolah's foot. We made a positive ID on that. You'll hear about that on the podcast. You'll hear about my dastardly day in Beverly Hills. I call today's podcast the $483 podcast because that's how much one day of my life cost me of making a stupid decision, a mistake. And again, my wife said I was stupid. And as you'll come to find out, I was stranded in Beverly Hills. And I'm not going to tell you what she wouldn't do until you listen to the body of the show. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Holy smokes, man. Today is Monday. It was a great weekend for football. I watched a lot of football on Saturday and Sunday, and I was looking forward to this day come about this weekend, as you'll come to hear in the body of the podcast. And right now, on Monday, as I record this uh, open to the show, I'm sitting there thinking I'm almost like got mm, some kind of syndrome. I'm thinking, okay, the lawn guys are going to show up. You're doing a podcast at your house. Where's all the lawnmowers and the blowers? It's two days early. It ain't Wednesday. It's only Monday. But you know what? It seems like in my neighborhood where me and my wife and my dogs live at, everybody here is remodeling. I mean, so there's construction sounds in the background. I don't know if you can hear them. And we're about to be under construction because we're putting in a new floor. We're putting in a trifold door here at 316 Gimmick Street. So now I won't be listening to the yard guys and stuff through a window. I'll have three doors that was nice and quiet. I can open them up and go out on a deck and just kind of chill out and let the nice, cool breeze refresh me. Or if it's Wednesday and the yard guys are out there, I can open up the trifold doors and say, Guys, I'm trying to do an award-winning podcast. Turn off the mowers and the blowers. You just woke up, Hershey. I t- when I started yelling, Hershey jumped and almost out of her. Well, she's already back to sleep she again. Oh, she was dead asleep, and I woke her up, and now she's back to sleep. So I couldn't have scared her too much. So anyway, we're about to be under construction here at 316 Gimmick Street. I'll tell you what. Yesterday, Sunday, I was getting all ready to watch Clash of Champions pay-per-view at 5 p.m. But the lady who's helping us with the design elements of this remodel was supposed to come over at 3.30 or 4. Was it 4? 4? Between 3.30 and 4. My point is... She was late. And so I'm sitting there thinking, you know how much of a time fanatic I am? I'm never late for nothing. If I am, I'm mad at myself because I would like to be late. What? Except to pick up your car before it gets stolen. Well, that's part of the other podcast, Kristen. You're about to give away the whole podcast. So I'm sitting there looking at my watch. I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm not into people being late. And then finally she shows up. I, mean, I don't want to beleaguer the point. The lady shows up and she starts showing all these drawings and stuff and then she starts talking about these other design elements which I didn't even have in mind because you know we're trying to do this on the bare basics, bare minimum type thing. It's not like we're trying to make this place into a palace. You know it's just a small regular house and she had all these great ideas and she's super talented with tremendous vision. Her and her partner are very very talented. But all of a sudden, I was like, man, this place is going to turn into something that's going to belong in Beverly Hills. And I didn't, and I don't want that, and I can't afford it. So anyway, I had to put the squash on a couple of the ideas, but I'm looking at all these drawings. I'm looking at my watch. 5 o'clock is almost there. Now it's 5 o'clock. Now it's 5.30. And now we're just talking about the yard. So I'm thinking, well, hell, I guess I'm going to watch the pay-per-view joined in progress. I wanted to catch the open. Watch uh, the anthem or whatever they sing before the thing starts and watch uh, the open and all the uh, different uh, video things that they do on the show, and I done missed it. So I'm about to tap out. I'm about to say, you know what? Let's just stick with the task at hand right now, and that's putting in the floors and this door right here and this trifold door in the backyard. So finally they left, and now we're waiting on the guy to come up with all the drawings of the house because you have to have these drawings, plans, or renderings, or whatever, to turn into the city of Los Angeles so they can grant you a permit so you can remodel your house. And it ain't like we're rebuilding this damn thing. Hell, we just want to put in a trifold door here, a trifold door over there going to the swimming pool, uh, paint it, and put a deck in the front yard. That's basically all we want to do. Swap out some window covers. 
That ain't nothing. But you got to pull a permit for all this stuff. And by the time the dude that's got to draw everything, he's like a surfer guy. He's like an old surfer. Yeah, man, I've been meaning to get to that, or I'm going to get to that sooner or later. Venice time. They call it Venice time over here, as uh, quote unquote, my wife just said. We're in Marina del Rey. Marina del Rey and Venice are damn near the same thing. They're just back up right next to each other. So, you know, I'm 51 years old. Believe it or not, I ain't never remodeled nothing in my whole life. I bought a couple of houses here and there, uh, but I ain't never remodeled nothing. I've seen my friends remodel stuff. But I see the permits put out there on the damn walls or the fence or whatever. I get it. I understand it. I just ain't never done it. And so it's a real pain in the neck, if you know what I mean. So between that going on, we're getting ready to try to make a trip to Sparks, Nevada to go see my brother-in-law. We're going to leave on Wednesday after we have a meeting down there and go talk beer with El Segundo Brewing Company. El Segundo Brewing Company, Broken Skull IPA, the best IPA in the United States of America. It's available all over California. Let me jump off that plug and go back to my story. So I figured since it's Monday right now, Tuesday I'm going to do a podcast for Thursday. Wednesday i got a meeting, and then we're going to leave Wednesday at noon to haul ass to Reno, Nevada, see my brother-in-law just to visit and catch up. Well, then my RV guy calls, and he says, Steve, the generator on the RV ain't working. Your carburetor's gone bad. We need a new one. I got an Onan generator on that camper of ours. And the Onan generator runs the air conditioner in the back of the coach. We kind of need that air conditioner because we've got two dogs. And if you're just driving the thing, if you're riding shotgun like my wife is, navigating, you're fine and dandy. But if you're back there in the box, it gets kind of hot. Your refrigerator can run off LP, propane, whatever they call it. That's all fine and dandy. But if you're going to go down the road and you're basically headed in the desert, you kind of need some air conditioning up in that mug. So I said, well, I'll be. Is there any way uh, you can get that thing fixed by tomorrow? He said he's already on it. He's got a carburetor coming and going to try to put the carburetor on my damn RV so the dogs ain't sweating bullets back there with Moolah and her spider bite. And you'll hear about the spider bite and the spider that bitter in the podcast. But anyway, that's all I got going on over here. I cut this podcast with my wife about two hours ago. Had a good time talking to her because normally we don't talk and she won't ever be a guest on my podcast. So this is almost like therapy for us. I'm kidding. Me and my wife talked all the time. Uh, that was a joke. It wasn't a very funny joke, but nonetheless. Kristen, we talk all the time, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> she said, yes, we do. <laughs> End of story. I'm going to finish this open. I'm going to roll we're the puck. Not, we talk on the phone when we're, I'm not even here. We're always talking. We're always talking. Don't let us fool you. Um, did the divorce papers come in yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com. Get a quote and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. All right, everybody. Like I said, I'm sitting here at 316 Gimmick Street and sitting here at my desk, my office, my Pearl Beer Neon Clock, secondhand spinning around like a rotisserie chicken. Hey, we've had a lot of cards and letters coming here to House 316 Gimmick Street wishing Moolah to get well. All right, that was a lie. That was complete BS. Moolah has not received a lot of cards and letters here at 316 Gimmick Street telling her to get well, but her foot is getting better. If you guys listen to the podcast in the past, you know I was talking about Moolah's left front foot getting bitten by a spider. And my wife noticed this a couple of, about a week ago, give or take. And she noticed she was limping. And so she looked at her pad, and that pad was just red and inflamed. It was kind of hot. Now, this is before the swelling set in. So anyway, she thought immediately, I better go take her to see Dr. Gary, our uh, veterinary guy that we've been dealing with for about 10 years. And this guy's just off the charts good, has a great bedside manner, and is extremely knowledgeable. 
But if he tells you something's wrong with your dog, something's wrong with your dog. And he's just one of the best there is, and we're so fortunate to have him. So anyway, Kristen goes in there, and uh, Moolah's in there. And it's funny thing about Moolah. She hates going to the doctor. So she sits there, stiff as a board, on the table, with her eyes wide open, with just her neck at full alert. And it looks like she's about to bite. And she won't bite, but she's just like those eyes of terror. And uh, anyway, Dr. Gary is just so gentle. So he starts looking around and feeling of her foot and examining it. Kristen, jump in here. My illustrious wife, Kristen, decided to jump in on the podcast right now as I'm trying to turn in a podcast now and another podcast tomorrow because we're going to make our way to Reno, Nevada tomorrow for about a week to visit her brother. I decided. <laughs> no, I said, hey, I need some help here. I can't cuss, and I know since you're not going to cuss anyway, this would be a great platform for you to get a couple of BS stories and help me turn in 40 to 60 minutes. Turn I know that since you don't cuss, this would be a great opportunity for you to help me turn in 45 to 60 minutes of either gold, silver, copper, aluminum, whatever it is, turn in for a podcast to Stacy over there at 90210. So anyway. No, she was on the table like a sphinx. Like a sphinx? Yeah, still. She, if she doesn't move, then she thinks Dr. Gary doesn't see her. <laughs> <laughs> so he starts examining her and he just, man, because the, the spider bite was so fresh, he goes, man, I don't know. The only thing I can chalk it up to is maybe a spider bite. And so he gave you some, what, antihistamines? Antihistamines, and she's taking some anti-inflammatories. And I tell you what, man, she came home, she's limping on that front paw, and it just break your heart to see her limping because she's only three and a half years old. And she was the runt of the litter, so she's a small silver lab, but she's extremely smart and has this great character and great personality, so we just love her. So I hate to see her in pain. And then that nasty, sorry-ass spider bite starts taking effect, and that venom, that poison that he shot in with those two fangs that he pierced her pad with started setting in, and, man, her pad just blew up. It's like it multiplied in size twice. Did you post a picture of that spider? No, I didn't post a picture of the spider. I'm about to get to the spider because we were wondering what kind of spider it was. It got Mula. So it turns out, like I said on the podcast earlier, uh, there was a spider out there in the driveway, and I crushed it with the uh, bucket that I used to pick up the dog mess. And the spider was kind of mean looking, and it kind of had a red back. And I told you about this. Yeah. I told you, I said, man, I killed a mean looking little spider out there. He just, I wasn't going to kill him, but I figured, you know what? He might bite the dog, so I'm going to kill him. So I crushed his ass, and I told you what it looked like. So anyway. Well, two days later, I spotted one inside the house. So what'd you do? <laughs> Strangled him. No, so you killed him. <laughs> of course I did. So you killed him, but you, you noted about the spider as well. So then we just Well, I took a picture of him so to, we could look him up. Yeah, so yeah. we looked him up. And like We just looked at uh, spiders of California, whatever. He's hairy and ugly. And he's kind of got an orange back. And that was the same one that I described to Kristen. She killed one inside the house. So it turns back to cut through all the BS, cut through all the chase. Mula, and I'm on VenomousSpiders.net. Mula was bitten 100% conclusive by a redback jumping spider. I'm going to read you about the redback jumping spider. And they're not the most dangerous spiders in the world, but they're pretty salty. Here goes. Redback jumping spiders are common in California. We live in L.A. Hello. It's one of the most often encountered jumping spiders in North America. Before I continue to read, why has this damn thing got to jump everywhere, Kristen? Why can't it just walk? Should I buy it a pogo stick? <laughs> What's the deal? Do I need to get the pole vault so I can get to where it's going? Some uh, spiders, Kristen, as I came to read, are like, uh, they're not like flyers, they're floaters. They're, they balloon. Just getting in a big breeze, they'll just kind of glide huh. and, let the bree and let the breeze carry on places. But anyway, back to the redback jumping spider. Many people believe that the redback jumping spider is particularly dangerous to humans due to its red back, which is definitely not the case. The name Johnson Jumper has been suggested as an alternative as it is a jumping spider. The name is probably less confusing. Habitat. Red-backed jumping spiders prefer to stay in their tubular, silky nests beneath debris, wood, or anywhere undisturbed on the ground. Since a red-backed jumping spider is a sight hunter, it stays in its nest during days and when the conditions for seeing prey are poor. 
What does it eat? I'm glad you asked that, Chris, and that was a perfectly timed question. Hey, I'm getting good at this podcast. You need to start your own show. <laughs> the Chris and Austin Podcast. Yeah. Diet. They eat prey almost up to their own size. The average size of their prey is, however, about half their own size. They feed on a number of different invertebrates, such as caterpillars, moths, and flies. They also eat spiders, most in the form of the larger females eating males. Hmm. Appearance. Jumping spiders are hairy and grow to approximately three-quarters of an inch in length. The size of individual spiders shows great variability. The back of a jumping spider is distinctly red with a black strip if it is female. The rest of the body is usually entirely black. Hmm. Now, the bites. The bite, Kristen, from a red-back jumping spider is not fatal. The bites results in swelling and pain at the bite site, especially on a little paw like Mula. The pain and swelling usually last for several days. Some people experience other symptoms as well from a red-back jumping spider bite. And the spider belongs to the salt city family. I don't care what family it belongs to. The jumping spider is not considered as dangerous as many other spiders since its venom is not as toxic as, for instance, the venom of black widows. Bacterial infections around the site of a wound should, however, be avoided at all costs. Uh, the uh, red-backed jumping spider is going to live to be well, about a year well, or two. Well, they live not in our house. And if we see one, we're, we're sight hunters too, <laughs> red-backed jumping spider. And said, let me send a notice out here and open up the window out here so I talk to the courtyard. I'm serving notice to every red-backed jumping spider on this premise, on this property I own. Okay, I own 50% of this, but my wife owns the other 50%. So uh, on behalf of our 100% combined, <laughs> you never know, we might get divorced. Uh, on behalf of our 100% combined ownership of this part of planet Earth, I hereby forbid any redback jumping spiders to squat on said premise. You either pay rent, you work, you mow the yard, wash the car. I don't care, but you got to do something, and you cannot bite my dogs. That's a little history on the redback jumping spider, Kristen. Well, you know, I was just thinking, remember when we lived in Malibu and we caught that um, black widow? Yeah. Molly, we named her. Yep. And we kept her for, what, two or three years? We had a black widow in a damn plastic. <laughs> it was a big-ass plastic thing, so, I mean, it was living a nice life. That spider, by the time and we I got... And I bought it crickets every week. Oh, yeah. Kristen would go to the pet store and buy crickets to feed the <laughs> damn thing. Here's the thing. As... as uh, green or you're you're like a vegetarian i can't believe it's you go buy a cricket and feed it to a black widow did that not go against any grain of your fiber about not hurting other animals i'm not much of a cricket person yeah the crickets i mean if they start rubbing their legs together and make a bunch of noise sometimes i can get on your nerves yeah sometimes when you're out in the woods they make too much noise and they're kind of like roaches yeah, I'm not really uh, fond of the crickets myself either. Locusts, locusts. I'm not really fond about a no. locust either. The, the noisy insects tend to bother me. Yeah, but go back to Molly. Okay, so back to Molly. <laughs> so we had this black widow spider when we lived in Malibu, and we captured it. We put in this little plastic aquarium gimmick. And so we put some little foliage in there. We put some, uh, like a, we had like a water cap full of yeah, water. Yeah. We had everything. You know, I was going to build a little jungle gym in there for the damn thing <laughs> so I could get exercise. Well, they don't really move too much. No, they don't. And they're fine with that. Yeah. I could have the, uh, you know, I could be like a black widow spider. I mean, just, just don't move a whole lot. <laughs> but I got to go to the gym and work out so, so I don't get fat. But we had this uh, black widow spider. We gave that thing to someone, didn't we? My friend Al. Yeah, we yeah. gave him now. So that's because he had a tarantula, and he just added Molly, Molly to his collection. So anyway, we gave uh, Molly the black widow spider away. She and... was the biggest black widow you've ever seen, too. I even showed the um, Terminex guy; he could not believe the size. Man, if I, if, if that if we'd have kept that uh, spider any longer and it had got big enough, I would have sent it down to my tax numbers had it mounted. <laughs> We would have put it over the damn fireplace. Yeah. But anyway, enough about Molly the spider. For those of you that asked about Mula, she's doing fine now. She's playing now. She's still on her. She finished her last course of medication yesterday. Yep, yesterday. So she finished her medication. Her pad is almost back to normal. She doesn't sell the uh, wound anymore. She's not selling it anymore. She kicked out and made a comeback. So that's the story about Molly. And Molly? You, oh, so, so that's the story about Mula. And talking about Molly, our former Black Widow spider. We so we could say we had a Black Widow spider as a pet. Yeah, we did. How would we define that uh, Black Widow as a pet? Would we say it was loving, it was quiet, it never <laughs> bothered us, it was, you know? But with the, tr the trouble with that 
we had a hard time cleaning its, um, cur- you know, his home because of all those weird. They have like a very strange um, web. And the web it's is like irregular cotton. in shape. Yeah. Black widows don't make great webs. But I can say we come from a Labrador. I, I had pit bulls back in the day. And Sam, I uh, was our pit bull back in the day. But when my wife turned me on to the Labrador Retriever breed, when we first met, I fell in love with the labs. So we used to throw in tennis balls and stuff like that. There was a couple times when my wife wasn't around, and I took Molly out of the cage to play. And I would throw the tennis ball. And Molly would never return the tennis ball. And to do the same thing with the, with the newspaper, she wouldn't get anything. So she wasn't good at fetching. No. And I was talking with Ted one time. I said, Ted, I got this uh, black widow spider. I was wondering, you know, maybe if we bring it out there to Tilden, if we go dove hunting, do you think this spider will go fetch a dove? And we never took the spider to Tilden, so I never got a chance to find that out. So uh, I can't say that a black widow is a great pet. If you just want to look at a plastic container and just have something to look at, I guess they're kind of cool. Why did we decide to keep the damn thing? I don't know, but it's kind of neat how they feed. They suck the juice out of the um, crickets. So I'd have Boy. a bunch of cricket carcasses in there. Yeah, so I'd reach in there and, you know, get out all the cricket carcasses. And I was too stupid to use, like, some tongs or, like, a reaching device <laughs> or some chopsticks or something like that. I would just reach in there with my hand and pull them out. And so I always thought Molly was going to pull a rib on me, jump on my finger, sink her teeth into me, and inject me with poison. <laughs> Because then I can just see, you know, I'd have to put a tourniquet on my finger. I always think about it like this. As long as, we, as long as we've owned a ranch, Kristen, not one of us yet has been bitten by a rattlesnake. And that one time in the pavilion when you saw that, oh my that gosh, baby yeah. rattlesnake, and it was about a foot and a half long, and I was in the uh, RV vacuuming it oh. out with a shop vac, and I can't hear anyway, and I hear this god-awful, <laughs> Steve, Steve. <laughs> Steve, man, I come sprinting across the parking lot at about six miles an hour. I'm like, man, what the F is going on? There's a snake. There's a snake. So anyway, we, we exterminated the snake. But my point is, y'all was thinking, you know, if you get bit by a snake, you know, like, like a real poisonous snake. Most people, when they get bit by a rattlesnake, don't die. But yeah, you but it's can, a horrible pain. But they can get a horrible infection. Yeah. And sometimes they got to lance it open. It's just got to heal from the inside out, and it might take months and months. So they can do devastating damage, and they can really eat you up. Well, we did have that big tarantula there that you relocated, and he returned to the front yard the next day. That tarantula was like a boomerang. <laughs> I would get my Kawasaki mule, take it about two miles from the house, and the next day we'd be back. <laughs> It was almost like if I could, uh, you remember like Spock used to put his uh, hand on something, he could mind meld with it. If I could touch the tarantula, you know, because tarantulas can't talk. But it was like if I could read the tarantula's mind, he would say, why do you keep taking me away from here? I just want to <laughs> hang out with you guys. <laughs> Hell, he'd be back the next day. I said, all right, get in the back. I'd put him in the back, take him, drop him off again. I mean, I tell you, he's like a boomerang. Yeah. He was like a bad code. You couldn't get rid of him. But anyway, enough about the, this stuff. But that, those are true stories. He it wouldn't is. go away. Yeah, he wouldn't. Well, it's like every time we see a turtle down at the ranch, a box turtle. Chris says, oh, we've got to take it to the pond and put him in the water. He's a box turtle. He didn't want to go in the water. I always so see you him always in the water. throwing him in the water. They don't want to be in the water. They walk across the damn pasture to get places. Yeah, but there's a whole bunch of turtles in the water. Yeah, but those are different kind of turtles. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just because you see a turtle don't mean the damn thing wants to be in the water. Maybe we should get in, not not be in the business of relocating things. No. Anyway, <laughs> on with the damn $483 podcast. What other stories were you going to tell about? Hey, before I get to my $483 podcast story, I want to tell you guys, we had a washing machine break on us about a year ago. It was actually about a year and a half ago. And on the spin cycle... This thing spins so loud that you would think that you were at the NHRA drag strip watching cars go down a damn quarter-mile strip. That's how loud this thing is. So finally, after a year and a quarter of putting up with this thing, me and Kristen looked at each other and said, man, just can't take it anymore. Well, the guy wanted to repair it, but he wanted 500 bucks to repair it. And 500 bucks is almost the cost of a brand-new dryer right, right. or a brand-new washer. So we said, well, piss on it. We don't want them to fix it. We just used it till it absolutely broke. Yeah, so we really <laughs> used it till the wheels fell off. And so, man, we went and got a new brand, and it was a different brand, but it kind of matches the one we got. And I won't, dis- dis- I won't disclose the name of the brand. I'd like to. No, but yeah, I you know you'd like to, but we're not going to. <laughs> and we're not going to acknowledge who we bought it from or who delivered it. But nonetheless, 
as soon as we get this brand new washing machine, it, it wasn't the fanciest one you could get. Top loader. It wasn't the Mac Daddy thing you could get, but it was a top loader just like the other one. And as soon as we get it, the damn thing starts screwing up. And it's like it doesn't make the crazy racket because the other one, the other one was so loud, I couldn't do a podcast while it was spinning. In the garage. In the garage <laughs> with these three doors from China closing my office off, and they're not insulated. But I'm just saying that's how loud this thing was. But it was such a pain in the ass that we finally decided, hey, man, let's get rid of some money because we're tight. But we're going to get rid of this thing because that's that's our quality of life right now. Well, so, and it wasn't working anymore. Okay, so it wasn't working finally, and we got every cent we could get out of it, and we go get this new one. They deliver it. They hook it up. They do everything. They run the first cycle. Well, it turns out. Kristen starts having a problem with it because it won't complete the cycle. And it turns out she gets on the phone with the technician who's in another country, and they say, oh, <laughs> you've got to calibrate it. The guys who installed it didn't calibrate it. Now, think about that. Calibrate. Calibrate to means to make adjustments to something. Kristen, back in the old days, you're only a year younger than me. When you bought a new washer and dryer from J.C. Penney, you just brought it home, hooked it up, and it worked. Yeah, you didn't for have like to 20 calibrate years. nothing. Yeah, it used to work for 20 years plus. Now things work maybe a couple of years. Yeah, so anyway, you don't calibrate nothing. There's nothing scientific about it. You just set it up, screw the little washers on the feet, make sure it's level, and you start throwing clothes in, a little bit of detergent, and you wash stuff, and it spins it, and you throw it in the dryer. It's pretty simple. You got to calibrate this thing. So I'm thinking, okay, they're going to send some guy over to calibrate it. Well, they talk to you over on the phone. But I'm thinking there's going to be some guy with a Geiger counter and a level and all these different no, instruments. No, I had the level. They, I happen to have a level in there. So you had to level it yourself. Yeah. yeah. See, <laughs> when, when, when someone delivers something that you paid good money for, it should be leveled, calibrated, screwed a little feet down the way it's supposed to be. You shouldn't have to redo this stuff. Right. But anyway, so now the thing is still adding up. And the other day, I kept trying to call my wife. I said, man, you never answered your phone. Because she was on the phone with someone from uh, overseas talking about whatever happens, she wants to get rid of this damn washer and get our money back and get a different brand. What did they tell you? Well, I told them if they don't come pick it up, I'm going to put it in the middle of the street and set it on fire. <laughs> then they just look at their little notepad and say, oh, we're so sorry. Um Whatever I I can't remember what they told me. No, they tried to they tried to give you the blow off again. He says I don't care. He goes I don't care uh, what your job is. I want to speak to a manager. Oh yeah yeah. They, he kept on repeating the same line over and over and over. I said just stop repeating yourself because I want a different answer this time. I want to speak with a manager. So then he's like oh okay well you'll have to wait for a phone call from the manager. I still haven't spoken with a manager. So anyway we're not happy with the design and uh, shoot. I said I want to return this item. I don't want it anymore. It doesn't work. And it says in the damn rules that you got X amount of days, and we started having trouble with the damn washing machine immediately. The first week I started calling. Ain't like we've been using this thing for six months, now all of a sudden, hey, let's go get a different model. No, it ain't about that. We just want something to wash our clothes. I'm not looking for something sexy. I'm not looking for some different bells and whistles that you can program so you can hear all these sounds when your clothes are through spinach. You can throw them in a the dryer. I just want something to wash my stuff, spin it, so I can dry it and wear it. <laughs> and it won't do it. And it keeps going back to the default mechanism. It says six to eight minutes left. Six to eight minutes left. No, it keeps doing that. So it's just it's, it's about got me at my wit's end. So like an, a 53-minute cycle lasts about two and a half hours. Yeah, I, I, can't, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't. I can't work like that. You know, when I put it on like the delicate cycle or like, you know, like guys wash clothes, all cold, don't even put no detergent in there and just wash it so it can get wet and, and spin it. So you get all the water out and then throw it in the dryer. And that, that's supposed to be a 36 minute cycle. I'm sitting there waiting. I got a meeting to go to. I'm saying, where the hell? I need my stuff. I can go to my meeting. <laughs> and it's in a lollygag rest. It's six to eight minutes left. It's been six to eight minutes for 20, 30 minutes now. Well, now I know why your shirts always smell. <laughs> You put soap no, in there. that was a load I put in where I just put my stuff that I wore to the gym into the stuff of the towels and just hit a dry sock. Oh, I didn't wash it that okay. time. But anyway, I digress. Getting out of my washing habits, I wouldn't recommend anybody do what I did. But it, it's lasted me 51 years, and now that I'm married to a, a wonderful wife who loves to wash clothes, so we're <laughs> we're in a good place. What was the? Uh, I wanted before I get to the $483 podcast story, I wanted to ask you about. What's up with your mother in QVC? <laughs> she loves QVC. 
The other day I get over there, I open up a freezer, and there are 90 pot stickers in a freezer. 90. I said, Mom, where did all these pop stickers come from? Oh, honey, I was watching QVC, and they said they taste so good. I'm thinking, well, how do you buy something and you haven't tasted it? So then I had to throw those. I gave those away because she shouldn't be eating 90 pot stickers. Well, she's on a low-sodium diet. Yeah, she's on a low-sodium diet, and pot stickers are loaded with sodium. So then I get something in the mail. 25 veggie burgers. <laughs> Mom, why did you buy me these veggie burgers? Of course, they talked her in. Th- these people can talk anybody into anything. But what did your mother tell you about the 25 uh, veggie burgers she sent you? She said they're delicious. You've got to try these. The people that call in swear by these veggie burgers. <laughs> so I said, okay, Mom, no more stuff from the Home Shopping Club or the QVC. And then I take her to lunch last week, and she's got this diamond ring on her finger. I said, Mom. It was a bling bling ring. <laughs> it was a bling bling. Mom, where would you get the ring? Oh, guess where? Uh, QVC? Yep, it was only seven dollars. <laughs> look at it, look at it, and she kept on moving it at the t- at the table, so it you know. Look at those glimmers of sunlight yeah. in there. <laughs> it was pretty nice, actually. Well, here's the thing. But it's not a diamond ring. Yeah, for seven dollars. But, but here's the thing: if I could have married you seven years ago when I did <laughs> and got you a seven dollar wedding ring, <laughs> I would have done it. I would have believed it. <laughs> I think it, look, it looks pretty nice. I had to put my sunglasses on when she came out the other day because it was flashing so bright. But man, there's something about those QVC men, and all of a sudden they're like it's you. evangelists. They they can sell anything to somebody. They can they can, they can sell ice to an Eskimo. And the thing about it is, they say, "Oh man, they're going fast," and they got this number that keeps oh, yeah, decreasing yeah. on there. And they're like, "Oh man, I got to move now." Limited I... quantities available. Yeah. And my mom's like dialing fast as she can dial. <laughs> it's like, man, you better buy this thing before they run out. Yeah, you miss out on a great deal because I, you know, a lot of times when we we'll go over there, she'll just say, "Well, you know, they're about to run out." It was, it was such a good price. Oh, but wait, she did buy you something that you actually liked on there. Which, which one was that? That gimmick flashlight thing. Oh, man, <laughs> she, her mom always buys me these things on QVC, and she sends them over to the house. I'm thinking, like, man, what the F are you buying me this stuff for, man? It's, it's like I'm never going to use it like the potato pouch. You know, that was the thing that looked like an oven glove, but you could stick about three potatoes in, and it cooked them evenly. Oh, she got you the oven glove, too. Yeah, the oven glove. Why didn't she <laughs> give me the oven glove, too? And that thing's too small. But she also got you that tool that you could use at the ranch because it takes off the, the seat belt if you get trapped, checks your tire pressure, and there's one other function that it has. Remember that? Yeah, but I want to go back to the, 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 the flashlight that you mentioned because I've been using this <laughs> thing. So what it is, this is a flashlight. It's like, you know how you can... Uh, it's big as a pen. Yeah, this is a flashlight that's the size of a pen, but it's, it telescopes. You know, no, like it's like an, an extender. It's got like when the professor used to teach in school. Yeah, like, like, an, like an antenna on a car. Yeah. I mean, you, you pull yeah. it out, it extends. So uh, it's pretty cool. And I, the first time I got a chance to use it was when our dryer was venting into this crawl space, which buckled up our floor. And I needed to see down there to see if there was a hose in there. And someone had jerry-rigged uh, this gimmick. I've talked about in the podcast in the past. We're replacing our entire floor. We're remodeling here at 316 Gimmick Street. It just takes a very And I've long never time. remodeled anything. I'm not remodeling. We're getting someone to do it. But it's a long, drawn-out process. But the other day, after yelling at people for four weeks out there at the Broken Skull Challenge, on a mountain in a desert, my voice was just shot. And I was like... I told Chris, and I said, man, I need to go get an appointment with the doctor. My throat's killing me. I just can't understand why I got a sore throat for four weeks. Maybe there's something wrong with me. And she goes, Steve, she pointed out the obvious. You've been yelling at people for four weeks, and then you do your podcast on another two days uh, of the week. So your voice probably just needs to rest. Well, that wasn't good enough for me. And I was about to go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And I said, you know what I'll do? I'll get the flashlight the telescoping flashlight and examine the back of my mouth and you know that thing that hangs down back there so i put the flashlight in my mouth it was pretty red and in my subsequent checkups Kristen, i might uh, end up open up an ent ear nose and throat shop here along with my podcast but it turns out my throat was kind of inflamed and red but now that i've rested my voice i feel much better so 
Uh, Marlene, I don't know if you listened to the uh, podcast or not, but I want to thank you for the telescoping flashlight, the uh, that potato you can pouch. Bend too. Do what? That thing you can bend it in any. Oh direction. yeah, you can bend it. You can bend it in any directions. So I mean, if you had to use this thing to to uh, do anything, you can do it with it. And uh, so I want to thank you, Marlene, for getting me that and a potato pouch <laughs> and all the other little gimmicks that you've gotten me over the years. But please, once you get back to QVC, do not buy me anything else. And you know what? The other funny thing is that every Wednesday night, Mom, what you doing? I'm watching Cooking with David. And then she goes into her huge spiel about cooking with David, and I have to hear about it. Some person named David is on QVC cooking, talking people into buying pans, food, whatever the else they don't need. That's what she watches every Wednesday and every Sunday, cooking with David. Yeah, but she don't really cook. No. Maybe she's doing it vicariously through David. <laughs> he must be one uh, charismatic cook. Uh, anyway, so what else did you have to get off your mind here, Kristen? Because I wanted to start talking about my four hundred eighty three dollars podcast, which still has me riled up and on edge because I spent $500 on something I didn't need to spend it on. Well, that whole topic makes me very upset. Why? Because it's a waste of money. Well, you should have read the damn sign. Well, I, I was Oh, in... I used a cuss, cuss word. You can, you can say damn oh, okay. on a family-friendly okay. show. Well, I, I, I was just kind of in a place uh, in Beverly Hills that I'd never been at. I'd just come to drop off a pint of blood, get some blood work done, and I didn't know the neighborhood, and I was just distracted. I was still frazzled from doing four weeks of Broken Skull Challenge, <laughs> yelling at people and doing two podcasts a week, so I was kind of just beside myself. I didn't have my wits about me. Did you already tell the story? or No, oh, I didn't tell okay. the story. I think you tell the story. But I did have my Broken Skull pocket knife in my, in my pocket, so I was prepared for anything. You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do, and I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com. Get a quote and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. All right, everybody, here we are back at 316 Gimmick Street. I'm here with my wonderful wife, Kristen. Hershey is laying on her side, sleeping by the couch. Mula is sleeping peacefully on the couch, and I can see her pad on her left foot from here. It is improving. The redness is still there, but it's drying out, so Mula is on her way to a full recovery. Here's a story about how this podcast got its name, $483. And you ever know sometimes, or you have, you ever have one of those days sometimes where you just can't do anything right, or you're trying to go about the process and everything around you kind of implodes or explodes? I had one of those days the other day, but it was a long time in the making. I'll go back to the start, and I'll fast forward and bring you back to my day that happened just the other day in Beverly Hills. A couple weeks back, I was filming Broken Skull Challenge. I was outside lifting weights. I noticed that there was something wrong with my left arm. I felt to my left elbow, and it was full of fluid. I took some pictures and posted it on my Twitter account, Steve Austin BSR. That night, they sent an emergency room doctor out to my trailer. They were going to drain it. Well, when he got there, he said, that's olecranon bursitis. I said, I know, and the protocol is not to drain those. He says... Go to your orthopedic surgeon in a couple of weeks and then ask him what you should do about it. He'll either drain it or he'll leave it as it is. Well, turns out, Thursday, two days after I just got finished filming Broken Skull Challenge, I'm putting around the house, lollygagging around, and I get a phone call. Uh, Mr. Austin, yes, this is uh, so-and-so at the Curlin Job Clinic. You had a 945 appointment this morning with Dr. Elitrash about your shoulder. Where are you? I said, oh, man. I said, you called on the home phone. I thought it was like an Amazon delivery or UPS or something. That's the only reason I answered it. They had our home phone number. I don't use that phone number. I don't listen to the voicemails on that phone number. All I use is my cell phone. I said, man, I'm sorry. That's completely on me. I just finished a project. Can I reschedule? And she said, is there any way you can get here within an hour? I said, yes, I can. So I jumped in the shower, put on some clothes, hauled ass down there to the Curlin Job Clinic. Uh, got in there, they called me into the office, and there I go, talking with Dr. Neil Elitrash about my shoulder. 
He's asking me how it's feeling. It's feeling good. I have full range of motion. And I started talking to him about what I was doing with my training. And I told him I was up to 55 pound dumbbells on my dumbbell incline, 35 on my shoulder presses. And he was listening as I dispersed all this information. And he kind of said, man, at five months, that's a little aggressive. He goes, if you were under my guidance, because I opted out of uh, rehab, because I had to go film Broken Skull Challenge, I wouldn't have you pushing the envelope that fast. Those microfibers are still growing into that shoulder. All of the work that I did there on my repair are still can be compromised if you use too much weight. So anyway, basically what he was saying is, you're in a real good spot right now. Your body is healing up amazingly well, but you need to throttle back on the kind of weights you're lifting. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I said, Doc, anyway, before I got out of there, I said, hey, Doc, a couple of weeks ago at work, I must have bumped my elbow or something because it swole up. And I showed him my famous left elbow. And he goes, yep, olecranon bursitis. I said, Doc. Say that 10 times really fast. Yeah, olecranon bursitis, <laughs> olecranon bursitis, olecranon bursitis, olecranon bursitis. See, I took my alpha brain. I could do it. So anyway, he says, uh, you know, what we'll do with that? He goes, you can either leave it like that and come back in a week or two since I'm just around the corner from you, or I can drain it now. I said, Doc, if you've got time to drain it right now, I said, that'd be cool. So anyway, he goes in and uh, gets all of his stuff. I'm sitting there in the damn waiting room for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then here comes him and his posse. And they come in there, and they got some little needles. And they got one big needle. And he goes, you're going to feel a couple of sticks here. I'm going to deaden this thing. And then we'll stick that needle in and drain the fluid out. He goes, I'm expecting that fluid to be clear with a little bit of blood on it. Because he was thinking it was just bursitis. Sure enough, he deadens it. I'm laying there on my stomach with my elbow stuck out there towards him. And he sticks in that big needle and draws out about 30 or 40 cc's of pure red blood. And he says, Steve, you must bang this thing on something because that thing is full of blood. What I'm going to do is send this out, see if it's infected for staph or whatever, some kind of bacteria infection, and I'll get you back the results. And then he shot in a couple of cc's of cortisone to calm the area down and kind of you know, be an anti-inflammatory agent, which is what cortisone is. So the shoulder's fine. I back off on the weights. And he says, I'm going to wrap this, uh, these two ACE bandages around your arm. Keep these things on. You can take them off tomorrow morning and go about your business. But don't train your left arm for about a week. So here's what I did. The next morning, I took off the ACE bandages. But because of the compression, you couldn't see the veins in my arm very good. Well, this was important because I had an appointment to go get my blood work done and drop off a pint of blood. So I go to this area, Kristen, which I've never been before in Beverly Hills, and I just park on the street because I'm thinking every time I've dropped off blood before, it's like I'm in and out because I hit a gusher and I get gone. So I pull up to the parking meter. I didn't even look for underground parking. I should have looked for underground parking. That's the biggest mistake I made. And 30 yards in front of me, I didn't see the sign that says no parking after 3 p.m. My appointment was at 1.30. My appointment was at 1.45. By the time I got in and they started working on me, I don't know what time it was, but I knew that I needed to go back downstairs and put some quarters in that damn machine or I was going to get a ticket. Well, I couldn't get out of the damn room. Because, but did you know you were going to get a ticket? Yeah, because there's only oh, one, okay. one hour is all you could get on your credit oh, card. Okay. And these are, these are damn parking machines. You can put credit cards in them now. So I only got one hour, so I know I'm screwed. So I go in there. Ain't no way I can get back down. And I just didn't want to say, hey, can you go put some quarters in my car for me? You know, to the one of the people that work there. So I'm figuring, okay. And here's the thing I was thinking, boy, Chris is going to be mad about this because I'm going to have to eat a ticket. Yeah. Every time I get a parking ticket, which isn't real often, but often well, enough. Well, it's often enough. Okay. So it's often enough. If that time I got one at rehab. A year. Yeah, when I was at shoulder rehab, I got the one for yeah. parking on a damn meter. So anyway, I'm thinking, okay, I'll just eat the ticket. So anyway, finally... It was, it, was, it was a bad day because normally when I give blood, I've got these garden hoses for veins, and they're very easy to find, and they hit a gusher every time. But because I'd worn that compression sleeve, all my veins were crushed in because it was a compression sleeve. So the lady, who is wonderful at what she does, sticks one in my vein here, and she does the sample stuff for the blood samples. But other than that, it won't give out any blood. So then she hits me again. Uh, on the uh, on my right arm, she says, "Let's try that right arm." 
and she hits me in the right arm. And after about 10 minutes go by, there ain't nothing but about 50 cc's of blood in a one pint packet. So I'm thinking, why is my blood not flowing today? <laughs> Normally, you know, when I bleed, I mean, it's a gusher. And she's looking at that bag and she's like, eh, we'll give it another 10 minutes. She comes back in 10 minutes. Now it's only got 60 cc's in it. And I'm thinking, this is a great place for a Snickers commercial. Not going anywhere for a while. Meanwhile, the damn time meter down there is tick, tick, ticking, and I'm about to get a ticket. I probably already have the ticket. So she, she comes back and she goes, you know what? If this thing doesn't get any better, I don't want to do this, but I might have to stick you again. And as Kristen can see, my forearms are visibly bruised because yeah. I got stuck so many times. So finally she was walking by, and I said, you know what? I said, it's taking a pretty good while. I said, why don't you stick me again? And she shook her head because she didn't want to stick me again. And she goes, okay, let's do it. Yeah, but the whole time you weren't thinking, geez, i got to get down there and put a quarter in the meter? Yeah, I was thinking that. But when they got a damn uh, vein, when they got a needle hooked to a hose in your arm, hooked to a bag, what did you want me to do? Walk down in the elevator <laughs> yeah. with the bag in my hand and collecting <laughs> blood out of my arm, put a couple quarters in the meter, and then go back up? Well, yeah, and especially you're a time fanatic, so it surprises me that you wouldn't. I know, but then it then comes into the you know the sterile you know place that I was oh. in. You know, they just walk around the street with a bag, <laughs> you know, blood coming out of your arm. So anyway, I've seen stranger things. <laughs> yeah, but there I am, and so finally the the lady comes over and she hits me for the third time in my left arm, and that was the arm that had the compression sleeve on it, so all my veins were crushed down. But this time, lo and behold, she hits a gusher. Thank God. So that thing fills up pretty damn quick. They wrap the damn uh, uh, tape around my arms, and they take the other little needle out of my arm, which had been sitting in there while they were trying to do the old switcherooski. And when they uh, taped on the uh, little gauze pads over the bandages they put on my arms, they used bright pink medical tape around yeah. you know the crux of my where my elbow bends on both arms so i've got <laughs> pink tape on both elbows you know wrapped around ultimate warrior style fashion so man i come down the elevator i'm thinking man i know i'm gonna see a ticket on my vehicle and when i come down on this very busy corner in beverly hills i'm thinking man traffic's flying by and it's flying by in the nearby lane which is where i was parked at on the curb I got a real sneaky suspicion when I round this corner, my gray Range Rover ain't going to be there. And sure enough, I rounded the corner, looked to my right, and there it was, gone. <laughs> I don't know how many people, <laughs> I don't know how many people have ever had their car towed. I think I might have only been towed one time prior to this in my entire life. And because I've been hit in the head with so many steel chairs, Kristen, I don't remember. But when you walk down... And you find out that your car has been towed. Did you think it was stolen at first? No, I knew oh, it was okay. towed. Okay. Nobody stole it. I knew it was towed because right there I saw the sign, no parking after 3 p.m. Mm. It had taken so long to stick me all those times, try all those different times, to get the blood, finally get the blood, wrap me up, get my ass out of there. It was like 435. So I'm thinking, oh, man. You know how big the city of Los Angeles is? It's about what all together... 13 million people. Yeah. L.A. proper, probably yeah. 4 million. But whatever, it's a big-ass place if you just do the math on it. So there's a whole lot of towing companies here. How do you find which yard they towed your car to? Especially when I don't hang out in Beverly Hills. We do the Marina Del Rey thing right here at 316 Gimmick Street. The tow yard's right over there because you see the people get towed right. off all the time. I get in the elevator, I go back upstairs, and I'm embarrassed because I'm a global icon and a national treasure. I'm pretty smart. I got two bandages around, two pink bandages around each of my arms, and I go up to the lady at reception and say, you know what, uh, I didn't use underground park, and I used the hourly meter, and my car got towed. Do you know who tows uh, from this area? And she goes, oh, you know, I don't know. So then I'm thinking, oh, man, this, now I'm really screwed because I'm in Beverly Hills, and i got to just start calling places at random to find out where my car is. And I wasn't about to pick you up. <laughs> well, let's, let's visit that for a second. So I call my wife because it's Friday afternoon. I'm ready to just kick back, have a good weekend, watch college football Saturday, pro football Sunday, and just kick back. It's been a long-ass four weeks, and I'm ready for my first real weekend off. 
Well, not so fast, my friend. When I said, oh, well, what about coming to get me? <laughs> Go I, ahead, answer it. I said no, because you should have read the sign. My wife refused <laughs> to pick me up on the streets of Beverly Hills because I was too stupid to read the signs. <laughs> I always look at the signs wherever I park, and I always have enough money in the meter. So I'm thinking, well, okay, hey, I'm a global icon and national treasure, but I also got a broken skull pocket knife in my pocket. <laughs> I got my billfold, my money clip, my credit cards in my pocket. I got a baseball cap on, some sunglasses. And you're hungry. I forgot about that. I got my camouflage <laughs> shorts on. I ain't eating since nine, 7 a.m. in the morning. So you know what? I'll just track this thing down, and I'll be fine. So the lady upstairs gives me a couple of uh, options to call. It turns out the people that towed my car was Tip Top Towing, and they towed it to North Foothills Drive in Beverly Hills. So on my damn uh, Siri thing, I say, Siri, give me directions to whatever, whatever Foothills Road. And Siri spits out some directions, and I hit the walking little feature on there, and it's .8 miles. So I got almost a mile walk. Well, it's going to be a walk because I want to ride. But my wife won't pick me up because I should have been looking at the damn parking signs. So I figure, <laughs> hey, no big deal. I'm in downtown L.A. I'll just flag down a cab. Downtown L.A.? Well, Beverly Hills, yeah. L.A., down, yeah. whatever. It's all the same to me. When there's big, tall buildings, it's just like downtown. <laughs> when you're from Edna, Texas, anything with a big building is downtown. So I'm in Beverly Hills, downtown Beverly Hills, whatever you call it. I'm looking for a cab because on TV... You always see the cabs go by. Or when you're just walking around and you just drive around, you always see cabs going by. Oh, but yeah. when you need a cab, ain't a goddamn cab to be found. <laughs> so I figure, well, you know, it's only point eight miles, two tenths shy of one mile. So I figure I just walk. So there I go. And before I can head off, I push a little button on the post to give me the white walking sign, the pedestrian right. sign, because, you know, I'm making sure I obey all the traffic rules because I've already broken a parking rule and got my vehicle repossessed by a parking service. So before I can leave, here's two ladies who come out from the office on the downstairs floor. Oh, are you the owner of the gray Range Rover? I said, Proudly, yep, that's me, <laughs> the guy that was too stupid to read the parking signs. <laughs> oh, we saw him take it away. If we would have known it was yours, we would have we would have stopped him. I said, no worries. They had to take it. It's past 3 p.m. Cars are zooming by like Larry the Cable by. Just, cars are zooming by just like Larry the Cable by. Cars are zooming by just like Larry the Cable guy. It's back to green flag racing. <laughs> they had to tow my car. So, of course, I got to take a couple of pictures with the women that watched my car get towed. And I got, exp you know, I didn't explain why I have these two pink bands on my <laughs> elbows. I look like an ultimate warrior walking down a damn street. So I push the damn gimmick button and I walk across the street. And it's pretty hot. Yeah, we've had a strange, very strange heat wave going on. Once you get us mugged out of like concrete and <laughs> yeah. the sun's beating down on yeah. you, and I've been laid up in that air conditioning trying to give out a pint of blood and just tearing <laughs> the life out of me because it couldn't hit the right vein. So all of a sudden I'm walking. I'm thinking, okay, four tenths of a mile, take a left on Burton Way, another four, three tenths of a mile, take a right on Foothills. It's going to be right up there. So I'm thinking, okay, I followed the directions. But I got to go to the Beverly Hills Police Department first to get a release before I can go to Tip Top Towing and get my car. Oh, boy. So then I think, well, where the F is Beverly Hills Police Department? But I've been there before. And you see I, it on TV all the time. I see it on TV all the time, <laughs> and I pass by it all the time because uh, UTA, United Talent Agency, reps me as far as my agents go. I get the damn shortcut. I cut across the road. There on my left, I walk right by the offices of United Talent Agency. Global icon of national treasure, schlepping by in a pair of tennis shoes, pink bandanas all over my arms, and a camouflage <laughs> pair of shorts trying to kayfabe the fact that I'm going to BHPD to get a release <laughs> on my car. I go inside the police department. I get up in the elevator. I go to the third floor. I go to the window. And as I look in, there's a big glass window. That's where they're behind that over there at the Beverly Hills Police Department. And this uh, lady officer looked up, and she had a gigantic smile on her face. 
<laughs> she, she recognized me right off the bat. So I just give her a big wave. <laughs> Hello, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I said, you ain't going to believe this. I said, I got my car towed, and they told me I had to come down here and get it released to get the thing out. I said, I've never done this before. What I'd do? Well, she goes, first of all, you got the wrong window. Let me walk you over to the correct window. <laughs> so she took me over there. Long story short, I had to fill out some forms, provide photo ID, give them my credit card because it cost me some money to get the thing uh, out of there. And so my first uh, bill for the day, as part as the $483 podcast, was $117. And that's what they charged me, and that's uh, the City of Beverly Hills Department vehicle release, $117. And I paid that on an American Express. Now, there's more bills to come. You which sound I'm, like you're on Judge Judy. <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> I wish Judge Judy, well, I'd have been guilty. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I get my release form, and she goes, just take this, hand it to the people at Tip Top Toe. And I said, well, I said, uh, where is Tip Top Toe? Well, that was the address I'd originally programmed in. It's another point six miles back the other way. <laughs> so my total walking distance, it was about 1.4 miles to Beverly Hills Police Department. Now i got to walk back to Tip Top Toe. And I go in there, present all my paperwork, fill out the forms, picture ID, credit card. So anyway, I get the receipt from Tip Top Toe Service, put down my American Express card, and that was $208. So now, 117 plus 208, but wait, there's more. Well, I don't know that there's more, but there is. So I'm inside there. I'm frazzled. I haven't eaten since, what, 8, 9 in the morning? I had brought a snack. When I called my wife and told her that my car had gotten towed and she wouldn't come pick me up because I was <laughs> stupid and should have read the signs, she goes, my God, when's the last time you ate? I said, breakfast. She goes, Don't, do you have anything to eat? I said, yeah, I got an apple and some peanut butter and a water inside the <laughs> Range Rover at Tip Toe Service, Tip Top, whatever the hell it's called. So anyway, I go over there. The guy says, let me go get your car for you. Of course, I had the keys. The keys All were on right, my belt yeah. loop. I said, here's the keys. And he brings the car over. And I said, hey, man. How do you guys move these cars without damaging the transmissions? Anyway, explain to me how they did that. It's not important for you to hear. This little gimmick thing goes under the back wheels, and they just lift it up, and you're oh. gone. So anyway, he comes riding up in my baby. You know, it would been nice if they had a detailer or something for me, Kristen. <laughs> it does need detailing. So anyway, I done got jacked for 117 bucks by Beverly Hills Police Department, and they were extremely nice, and they were really, really cool. And then the guys at Tip Top Toe Service billed me for $208, and they were really, really nice, and they were very professional, and they did their job. I parked in the wrong spot, and I was just fixing to get in my vehicle and head that thing home, and I was going to tell Siri, give me directions to 316 Gimmick Street. He goes, oh, uh, one more thing. I'm thinking, what in the world could it be? He goes, you also got a ticket. <laughs> Those rat bastards, the parking enforcement had saw fit to give me a ticket. I just thought after I paid 117 to Beverly Hills Police Department, 208 to Tip Top Toe, that I was done. But no, I wasn't done. There was more. They handed me the envelope underneath the windshield wiper. I opened up the envelope after I got in the car and turned the air conditioner up to level six and put it on recirculation because I'd been walking in the heat. I was dying of thirst. <laughs> My throat was a little bit parched. Here's one thing. When you walk into Tip Top Toe, they'll ask you if you want a nice drink of cold water. And they got a refrigerator full of water bottles. Thank you, Tip Top Toe, for the cold water because I, I might have died had I not got it. <laughs> and then almost died of shock. The ticket was $158. <laughs> $158. I put my credit card into the machine, Kristen. All I could get was a dollar's worth of parking. One hour. One hour. Okay, before you jump in here and just start sh shredding me, I should have seen the sign 30 yards in front of me. I'm well aware of that. I'm almost a Los Angeles native now, although I'm always going to be from Texas. I know the lay of the land here. I should have looked for the sign. I should have went to underground parking and just got the little gimmick like you always do. Go through the booth, talk to the lady or the dude there, give him your credit card, and then just get, get out when the alligator arm lifts up and you get out of underground parking. 
At the very least, had there been an earthquake, I wouldn't have been in underground parking. But there wasn't an earthquake. I got a $158 ticket, and my damn car's gone to tip-top toe. That's your third reminder of the, uh, uh, they keep reminding you as, you as you progress that day of the bad decision you made with the ticket, then the towing, then the police department, and how much did you spend on parking initially? A dollar. A dollar, okay. Well, yes, a dollar I, for an hour? That's pretty good. That, that's what it was. So wow. I guess I guess I said uh, 483. I guess if you included, well, that, that wasn't really a penalty, but I could say this is a $484 pod- podcast, but I'm going to stick it to 483. All right. So, but here's the thing. I tried to do a good thing uh, to check on my health, get my blood tested, and also drop off a pint of blood. So they're in the process of trying to help my brother out and then <laughs> got stung on the backside because I parked in an area that you ain't supposed to park at. They towed my car. Everybody who had something to do with it wanted something out of it. So everybody that wanted something out of it, that means that because I was a responsible party, that that money was having to come from my back pocket. Or in my case, because I use a money clip, my front pocket, where I keep my credit cards and my driver's license. And both were used plenty that day because everybody wanted to see who I was, and they wanted proof of who I was. I could just go out there and say, if you want your car back, give me a hell yeah. I had to show them a picture. <laughs> yep, that was me, the, dumb, <laughs> the dude that you used to see on TV all the time, guzzling beers. Here I am in person, looking like, looking like an idiot behind the glass saying, can I get my car back? <laughs> and here's the topper to the story. Because where I was at in uh, Beverly Hills, and I was going to Beverly Hills Police Department by way of Tip Top Toe, I passed right by Maple Street in Beverly Hills. You know anything about Maple Street? No, what's what's Maple Street? Maple Street is where Podcast One headquarters are at. Oh. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take a chance to call Norm at Podcast One, the guy who owns it, my buddy. So I'm going to call Norm at Podcast One. I'll see if he's there. Maybe he'll give me Maybe a ride. Maybe he'll give you a ride. Yeah, that's straight <laughs> up what I was thinking. And it'll be just good to see him. So, so I said, Siri, call Norm Pattis. She, I got about six numbers for Norm. So push this one. It's Podcast One. The lady says, Podcast One. I said, this is Steve Austin calling for Norm Pattis. The lady says, hang on, I'll see if I can get him. And she automatically hits his cell phone button. And I said, is he there in the office? Well, she didn't hear me say that. So all of a sudden, about a minute and a half later, Norm's phone is ringing, and I'm still walking. I said, hey, man, what's going on? He goes, oh, I'm just over here at the club in Newport Beach enjoying a beer. (laughs) <laughs> Boy, when he said he was enjoying a nice cold beer and I was walking the streets of Beverly Hills and I done put in about three miles of leg work and he's having a beer on a Friday afternoon because he had a bust ass hard week and now he's celebrating and he's smart enough to park in an area that they ain't going to take your car and I was going to use him to give me a ride to Beverly Hills Police Department where I was going to get my release form I said, man, I said, you ain't going to believe this. I said, the reason I'm calling is because I'm walking right by your office right now because I was out there giving some blood, and then I parked in an area where they towed my car, so I was going to see if you'd give me a ride to, to the police department. And he goes, no. He goes, but go on in. Someone from Podcast One can take you over there. I said, don't worry about it, Norm. I said, I'll just uh, I'll take care of it. I said, at the very least, this is podcast material. He goes, no, no, no. Go inside and ask someone to take you over there. I said, no, enjoy your beer. I'll talk to you in a couple of days. And he says, well, you and Chris ought to come down to the club. We'll have a cold one. (laughs) I said, man, I'm just going to enjoy the weekend, and we'll have a cold one later. So it was just kind of like either salt in the wound or everything coming full circle that on my way through all this cluster muck of a day that I had to start off because I did something very stupid, I'm walking by my buddy's place, Podcast One, and here I am talking about it on the Steve Austin Show with my illustrious wife, Kristen, and we all started this thing about a conversation with Moolah and the Redback Jumping Spider and QBC, and finally, how the $483 podcast came to be because I was a dumbass and parked in an area I wasn't supposed to park at, went through all the trials and tribulations of giving blood, going through all the due process of trying to get my vehicle back. And at the time, when you're walking down the street and you look like I look, you know, and you kind of almost got the ultimate warrior look because you got the two pink things hanging off your arms, I look like a friggin' idiot. 
I did kind of chuckle when you walked through the door. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like Spirit of 76. You got a guy who played a snare drum, a guy playing the flute, the guy with a limp and leg. I come walking in, and I just looked like I was beat down. I was frazzled as hell. I was like, really? I did give you a hug. What? <laughs> Boy, that, that hug meant the world. And as she hugged me, she whispered in my ear, could you go pick up the dog mess? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, it's time to say goodbye on this illustrious podcast. I want to thank you for joining me. You got any plugs or anything like that you want to put in there? Plugs? Yeah, like, like hey, I'm Steve Austin BSR on Twitter, or no. you got a book coming out, or no. something. Okay, you got a Zoom <laughs> no. class coming up. No. All right, uh, this is Steve Austin coming back up to wrap up his show. That was a true story, and that's the $483 podcast. Thank you for joining us for another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show. Please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends. For more Steve Austin Show, go to podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. And welcome to T-Pain's Nappy Boy Radio Podcast. The most fun you'll ever listen to while you're folding your clothes. Now let's get this straight. This is not. Your average podcast, T-Pain's Nappy Boy Radio, is super fun, super crazy. It's pretty much an in-your-face conversation. That's the good thing about us. We don't do interviews. We do conversations. All of my guests, all of my co-hosts, we chill. We drink. We play games. We have the song of the week. We have the creative curse word of the week. As long as you're having fun as our guests. Speaking of guests, each week I'm going to go through my whole contact list and dive head first into the world of music, gaming, exotic cars, tech, Strippers probably, doctors probably, probably strippers that are only stripping so they can pay for tuition to become a doctor. You never know. My wife is a certified bartender. She'll make you a drink while you're here. We'll get you drunk and make you play VR after. It's a lot going on. But that's what it's all about over here at T-Pain's Nappy Boy Radio Podcast. See you soon, baby! Yo, what's good? It's your boy, Big Brother Jake, a.k.a. Jake Warner. My government name. Check it out. I host a show called the Big Brother Jake Podcast, and I've taken my talents to the biggest and baddest platform on the planet. That's right, baby. Podcast One. My show is unique as I talk about everything. Life, sports, entertainment, being a single dad juggling several jobs. <laughs> I'm a hot mess, but it's damn entertaining. Subscribe and review now on Apple Podcasts and listen on Podcast One or wherever you get your podcasts.